Wild Health is about optimizing you. We use genomics, blood work, biometrics, microbiome assessment, many other tests, and a conversation with you to come up with a full health optimization plan. What's the perfect diet, exercise, and supplement plan for you and only you? The Wild Health Podcast is about optimizing all of us. Here we cover the cutting-edge science that gives you the base to be able to apply the personalized plan we give you as a patient. To sign up as a patient, go to wildhealth.com. Or if you're a physician or health coach and you want to learn how to do this for your patients, we're happy to help as well. Wildhealth.com for all the information on becoming a patient or working with us. Good morning, Thursday, July 16th. Thank you for joining us on the Wild Health Podcast and a COVID update for the week. Mike, it's been a week since we've talked and things are looking a lot better. Oh, you know what? I just misread the numbers. I'm looking at them again, and it is not better at all. Um, not to make light of it, but uh, there are three and a half million cases in the United States with 139,000 deaths now, approximately 13 and a half million cases and 582,000 deaths worldwide. And it unfortunately is not slowing down as we speak. Data from the Financial Times shows that the global death toll is actually on the rise largely because of surges in Latin America and the U.S. The seven-day rolling average of daily deaths increased to nearly 5,000 daily deaths worldwide. Latin America has about 2,000 daily deaths, while the United States is averaging more than 700 deaths a day. Uh, We were talking about weekly, and now I'm talking about daily, so just so you understand those numbers, which is an increase of more than 200 deaths a day since early July, just a couple weeks ago. And I just mentioned deaths there quite a bit because we do hear kind of rumblings uh, around of people saying, well, the case is just going up because we're testing more. Well, deaths aren't going up because we're, we're testing more for sure. So that is an indicator that we can look to, and it's a little less um, politicized with a little less question marks around it because it is true that when you do more testing, you do find more cases. But when things like the percentage of positive tests are going up and deaths are going up, then that is not a situation that just looks bad uh, because of a lot of testing. Even that average in the U.S., uh, that 700 a day, is likely going to increase some more as uh, more than 900 new coronavirus deaths were reported in the United States on Tuesday, um, two days ago. So we were giving you the rolling averages before, but it, it seems like there's even an uptick now. There were 132 of those deaths in Florida alone, which was a new single-day record for that state. Alabama and Utah also reported record-breaking death tolls in the past day. And we've talked about death tolls being kind of a lagging indicator. Um, and so the big spikes, the 65,000 a day and of new cases that we're seeing now, those effects are going to be even later. So those, those numbers could continue to get worse. It was approximately 65,500 new cases confirmed in the U.S. on Tuesday. This was the second highest daily count yet. California, Texas, Missouri, Nevada, and Oklahoma all reported single-day records in new cases. There was an article published in the Washington Post that pointed out that the United States is the only country outside of the developing world to be going undergoing this kind of explosive growth. The number of new cases in Florida alone far exceeds uh, most other countries. It's one of the top countries right now, if it was a country. There are about 155 coronavirus vaccines currently under development in the world, and four of those have moved to phase three trial in which the vaccine's efficacy is tested on a large scale. And there was a new report in the New England Journal of Medicine showing some promising results from one particular vaccine candidate, the the one created by Moderna. New data from the company's trials show that the vaccine did provoke an adequate immune response and has minimal side effects, at least in the first 45 people to receive the vaccine. So there was a lot of excitement over this, um, which is we should be excited for vaccines to come to the market. But again, just 45 people in this first study. So you got to be a little bit cautious about that. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna need some vaccines because apparently um, people don't really want to socially distance or, or wear masks. I was just, I was talking with, um, actually recording a podcast with a friend uh, who's currently in Florida at the beach. And uh, they, I guess they had this vacation planned for some time with their family. And uh, they said that it was basically like, 
like nothing was going on. Like people were just, people were walking around without masks. She said that less than 5% of the people that she saw out were actually wearing masks. And that's, this is now, this is like, as Florida is breaking all of the records, uh, people are still not, uh, still don't believe that it's happening. Still don't believe that it's out there. It just, it blows my mind. So yeah, we need a vaccine because well, <laughs> it doesn't seem like people are going to change their behavior. Well, but why do you think people are going to be okay with the vaccine <laughs> if they're not okay with the mask? I mean, I, I, mean, don't, I don't think, well, I'm just grasping at straws here. Yeah. I mean, in all, in all seriousness, I, that's been a big question mark in my mind. Once we do get a vaccine, I just hear so much chatter from people about not trusting that not trusting the government. And and for good reason, we're seeing a lot of things right now that, that do make us skeptical and fearful. Um, but I, I'm worried that even when we do have a good, efficacious, and safe vaccine, that we won't get the numbers of people um, doing it because it is a voluntary thing, just like masks are. Even though we mandate them, it is really hard to enforce that. So if we've mandated masks and people aren't still wearing them, then when we get a vaccine, I'm not sure how that's going to go. But again, we'll see. I'm just glad they're being developed uh, and they hopefully will be available in the future. Speaking of masks, uh, infectious disease experts continue to urge the public to wear masks. Uh, in an interview this week, CDC Director Robert Redfield stated that the outbreak could be under control within a month or two if everyone heeded CDC guidelines and wore masks in public. Um, sure. Uh, I'm not sure they will though. Um, and, and also his month or two, I'm not sure if that would be the case or not. I think it is, um, likely though, or, or potentially possible. There was a case report that kind of backs up this thought that he had, uh, demonstrating why that could be possible. Um, it was, it was a case report about a Missouri hair salon, which you may have heard news about in early May. There were two hair, hairstylists at this hair salon in Springfield, Missouri, who developed symptoms of COVID-19 within a few days of each other. They both continued to work with clients for about a week until they tested positive for the virus and then began, began to self-quarantine. And through comprehensive t contact tracing, all 139 clients that were exposed to the stylist were identified and closely monitored and not a single one developed symptoms or tested positive. Now, I remember when this article came out and at the time, this was in early May, this was over two months ago. And at the time we were opening things back up and this was, I remember being pointed to quite a bit as, hey, look, th this is not as bad as we think. Look what happened. These hairstylists practiced for a week and nobody got it. Maybe this is kind of the summer and the warmer months coming on and we're gonna be okay. I look back now and have a very different interpretation of those events. Um, when they when they really dug into what happened, it seems like that the salon really adhered to the public health guidelines at the time when it comes to wearing face masks. In follow-up interviews with the clients, they all said that both the clients and the stylists both wore some sort of face covering throughout the entire encounter. So I think this is a good example of how effective masks are we know that this isn't just going away and disappearing like the article or like the story made some people think initially but instead it's a very good um, it's a very good example of why mask wearing would be important <sighs> yesterday uh, or two days ago I'm sorry the White House ordered hospitals around the country to bypass the CDC and you know what Mike I'm not going to go over this study <laughs> It's uh, or not study, but just this this news. I think the news outlets can yeah, you can stop can right cover there. this just fine. But I don't as we as we talk about that story, it's almost impossible not to get political or to to uh, um, ha there be some conjecture about why and what it means and stuff. So let's just stick to the numbers and talk about what the virus is doing and what people can do um, to protect them themselves. Speaking of numbers, I got some numbers for you, Matt. We got two articles that I want to talk about. The, the first one is less of a, a research article and more of a math problem, uh, but it's a really interesting one. And the second one's about um, our old stomping ground, echocardiography, which will be interesting. So this first article is an important one. Uh, it's entitled, How Can a Disease with 1% Mortality Shut Down the United States? I think that's a really good question, uh, and the article does a really good job of explaining it. So let's just assume for a minute that the mortality rate of COVID-19 truly is 1%, and I think that there is some assumption there. We don't truly know what the mortality rate is. It could be a touch higher. It could be a touch lower, but let's assume it's 1% because that makes the numbers good, and that means that basically one out of every 100 people who get COVID-19 are going to die of the disease. 
Now, that doesn't sound like a big number, and people are using that number to sort of explain away why we need to open back up and not destroy our economy and why it's not much worse than the flu. But let's talk a little bit about that number. So if one out of every 100 people who contracts COVID dies, that means that for every one person who dies, 19 are going to require hospitalization, 18 have permanent heart damage for the rest of their lives, 10 have permanent lung damage, 3 have strokes, Two, have neurological damage that leads to chronic weakness and loss of coordination. And two, have neurological damage that leads to loss of cognitive function. Now, so that 1% fatality rate now becomes, if you look at the size of the United States, 3,282,000 people dead, 62 million people hospitalized, 59 million people with permanent heart damage, 32 million with permanent lung damage, almost 10 million with strokes, and 6.5 million with muscle weakness along with another 6.5 million with cognitive function. That really puts it in perspective in my mind. It, this explains why uh, if we just open back up, the economy is not going to survive because you think about all of those people who are critically ill or, or whose lives have been upended, upended. Not, not just that, but also the strain on the healthcare system associated with just opening back up and not treating this as a, a true global pandemic. Yeah, and I think it's important to talk about this. I, I will say that I think I, I dug into this um, article a little bit and the, the exact numbers, I think you could point out tons of problems with it. I mean, um, the numbers we read at the end were if the entire United States was was infected, uh, which is not going to happen before we get herd immunity or a vaccine. There are also things like um, they say 18 of those who have permanent heart damage for the rest of their lives. Well, that's not that's not possible to know um, just because we're so early in this. Um, so there are issues with the numbers, and I only say that because if you're listening to those and you heard the, n the numbers too, I don't want you to just dismiss the point. The point of this is that people are frequently talking about the mortality and when I'm talking to people individually, I over and over emphasize them like I'm not as as a healthy person. And most of the people in my circle are pretty healthy. I'm not super worried about the mortality. I'm very worried about the mortality for elderly and, and really sick people. But I'm worried about the morbidity. And no one's talking about those numbers. And those numbers really add up when you think about all the things that can go wrong with this disease. I mean, a, a, a mortality rate, even we even said a mortality rate of 1%, which some people probably rolled their eyes and said, well, no, it's half that. It's 0.5. We don't know exactly what it is, but the point here is what we want you to hear. You could ignore all those numbers, but as a young, healthy person, I was just texting with someone yesterday who their, their aura ring data, they were showing me they had three days in a row, really low HRV and an increased heart rate, and we were worried it may be early COVID, and they were like, well, but I'm young and healthy, and I'm going to be fine. I said, that's true, but you don't want to have a stroke. You don't want all these other things, and when you add them all up in the aggregate, it's a risk that is really too high to just want to go and get the virus and hopefully be immune. I don't think that's a good strategy when you think about all the things that could happen, not just death. Death is only one, um, so we got to think about the others too. Speaking of the cardiac, did you? Was there a uh, Mike? For those of you who don't know, which most of you probably don't, Mike was an international expert um, prior to us getting into genomics and precision medicine. He was an international expert in echocardiogram of ultrasound of the heart, and so there was a really interesting article that just came out recently on cardiac effects of COVID nineteen. We'd like to dig into. I think this might actually be where they were getting their numbers from. Was using this study, so this is global evaluation of echocardiography in patients with COVID-19. This was uh, published in the European Heart Journal on June 18th, 2020. This was a study of around 1,200 people, 1,216 people to be exact, from 69 different countries that had echocardiograms performed. Now, these were all patients who were hospitalized, some of them in the ICU, some of them in the general medical ward, but generally a, an overall sicker population because they were hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Uh, they found that overall, at 55% of the patients who had the echocardiogram, echocardiogram had an abnormality of some sort. Around 
40% had left ventricular dysfunction. So the left ventricle is the part of the heart that squeezes blood to basically your entire body. Uh, 40% of those people had a decrease in function of the left ventricle. About a third of the people had a decrease in function of the right ventricle. And then small percentage numbers had more severe issues like myocardial infarction, which is basically a heart attack. That was in 3%. Uh, myocarditis, which is where globally the heart isn't squeezing very well because of the viral infection. That's around 3%. And then another 2% had basically broken heart syndrome, what we call takasubo cardi cardiomyopathy, which is in essence broken heart syndrome where part of the left ventricle isn't squeezing appropriately. So this is really interesting. Up to 15% of the patients had what we would describe as severe ventricular dysfunction. This tells us that one, COVID-19 is definitely affecting the heart. I mean, that is that is without a doubt. And that makes sense because there's plenty of ACE2 enzyme in the heart. So the virus itself can actually affect the heart very easily because of the enzyme present on the on the cells of the myocardium of the myocardium. But also this paper found that 33% of the patients who had these echocardiograms had a change in their management. Just the presence of cardiac dysfunction, while interesting, is extremely important clinically because we treat people differently based on how their heart is functioning. Sometimes you give them more or less IV fluids because of their cardiovascular function. Sometimes you use different medications, different, uh, different pressors or medications to increase blood pressure based on how their heart is squeezing. So this is extremely important information and you know, not something that's, I guess, overall surprising to us coming from the world of ultrasonography prior to, prior to this, but, but extremely important for the medical community to understand and make sure that they are actually looking at the hearts of these patients with COVID-19 and appropriately changing their, uh, their treatment of those patients based on those findings. Yeah. Um, I heard someone a while back, uh, talking about, I think it was either the SEC or the NCAA plan to do echocardiograms on all of the returning athletes because they're worried if anyone had COVID, there would be some abnormalities. And at first I thought that was pretty ridiculous. They'd probably just find some, some hokum, uh, maybe, which would potentially be good, but thought it was kind of a strange thing to do. But this study, uh, maybe not, um, maybe not. That's not such a, such a bad idea. When I did first read the study, my first thought, to be honest, was, uh, well, look, these are ICU patients. Um, when they're in the ICU with sepsis from a viral pneumonia or whatever, they're going to have some changes. So I wasn't super impressed with that 55% number. But I, when I dug in, I found out, first off, they weren't all in the ICU. Only about half in the ICU and half were on the floor. So it made the number seem a little high. But then I really wanted to compare that to um, what it looks like for other people who don't have COVID who are in the ICU and are just as sick, because that's the m most important thing to me. And there is a, there was a really good study in 2020 that looked at that. Like they, they just echoed uh, all the patients in the ICU. And they found that about 5% had severe left, uh, had severe dysfunction. And in this study you just mentioned, 15% had severe dysfunction. So it would seem, and, and in this study they had half on the floor as well, so they weren't quite echoing as sick of patients. So what that tells me is that COVID affects the heart at least three times more probably than just being really sick because that was a question I had at the beginning why these people are just really sick is why they had change but it seems like it is more than that and maybe for some of the reasons um, that you alluded to Mike but it is important for us physicians to think about it's also important to think about potentially for recovered patients if someone went into the hospital and they were admitted or in the were in the ICU and they never had an echo and they, they probably won't because it's, if you order an echo, that means you're exposing someone else to this because this is a study that is done at the bedside by a person. So everyone is not getting an echo who is admitted for this, and even all ICU patients are not getting an echo. But if, as a physician, if you have one of those patients that come out, it may be good to get an echo and see what kind of changes and start addressing that dysfunction um, that is probably going to be there in a large percentage of patients. I suspect that the majority of these patients are probably going to have resolution of these findings after the, their illness, assume, obviously assuming they get better and get discharged from the hospital. But the, the possibility is there that some of these could be lifelong. You know, for example, that myocardial infarction group, you know, those, that 3% may very well continue to have some, 
some cardiovascular dysfunction in the future and probably some in the myocarditis group and the LV dysfunction group. And so there's, you know, as we mentioned earlier in the prior study, there's some morbidity associated with the, this disease that I don't think we really truly know the long-term implications of yet that is going to start to become elicited um, in, the, in the coming months. Yeah, and when you just say abnormal changes, I mean, I've had cardiac changes just from um, <laughs> an ultra marathon um, acutely that, that uh, did not stay with you. And so, so if, if you're just really sick or just extreme exertion, you can get some cardiac changes. But the main thing, that 15% um, severe dysfunction, that's the number that I worry about. It does seem like the numbers you said earlier, like 19% of people having, having damage. I don't know. I think the 10 to 15% is maybe a realistic number for people that may have long-term findings. And that's a pretty big number, pretty scary number to me. Certainly. Well, thank you all for listening again. Uh, we have a couple of really great podcasts coming up in the next several days. One on SIBO, non-COVID related topic. Uh, and then another one with Dr. Morgan Levine of Elysium talking about DNA age, DNA methylation, some non-COVID topics for you. Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. If you found it helpful, give us a five-star rating and write a review on iTunes. It really helps the podcast and we greatly appreciate it. If you want to be a client or you want to work with us, go to wildhealth.com. Thanks again.